is about you, right? But it doesn't necessarily speak to the individual elements that are in here. The article or the article impact are measures that specifically talk about an, an individual paper. So I think the paper um, from a few years ago, and you can actually get in all of these indices the number of times that paper was cited. <coughs> and that's all that is, the citations. It's just how many times that article was cited. Okay. Now, you know, all of the, I can't remember if I did that, I didn't. So all of the, um, all of the, the things we talked about, citations still hold true, right? Um, it doesn't say whether those citations are good or bad, right? This could be that they said, these people have no idea what they're talking about, they mischaracterized everything in their study, and this is an example of how not to do a paper on neuromuscular consequences of whatever, right? Um, I don't think that's... Yeah. But um, so so that's just there, and the different the different indices have different numbers, right? And you can characterize those the same way we talked about citations relative to authors, right? But this is about the individual uh, article. So this is a new one, and this is not one that I, I know a lot about. Um, but I think there's some value in thinking about this, especially for early career uh, folks. So how many of you have heard of this alt metrics? Okay. So um, this, the idea of altmetrics is it's the creation study of new metrics based on the social web for analyzing your impact, okay? And so it explores readership, diffusion, and some different things relative to that. So the way this works is if you put an article up, say on a web page, you can use this badge, right, by including some language in HTML language in the website that will track all of these things and give you a score for your alt metrics. So this one that I pulled it from um, said it was picked up by 52 news outlets, blogged by one person, tweeted by 1,333 people, and so on and so forth. So sometimes when an art article first comes out, it might be part of a special issue, for example, and there was a press release about that, there were press interviews, it was written up in newspapers, People were talking about it on social media, okay? This thing has not been cited one time, right? Um, but you have some evidence that it's already begun to make uh, an impact in, in multiple ways. Um, Gerald can help you with that. I have no idea how to do this. Um, <clears throat> but, but I gotta be honest, I wish that was around when I was an early career scholar because um, I think it would have been helpful. And it would give you an indication too, I'm, on, you know, if, are people even paying attention to this in the early, early phases? So, it says 137 readers on Mendeley. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah. What is it? It's like EndNote, right? Like, yeah. you just yeah. you save, you can save articles in there, and then it will, you can take notes on the articles, and then it will, like, create a reference list for you based on all the articles that you've saved. It's just like a, a centralized location to store all of the research oh, that you will. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that means, so those readers thought this was this piece of work was important enough that they saved it. Saved it. Okay, good. So this this might be something to consider. The, the, the downside, as far as I can see, is that um, you're going to have to put this link on a web page somewhere, or it doesn't follow it, right? So all of the speech language pathology and audiology journals, they have adopted Alt metrics now, so when I click on any of my articles in one of those journals, there is an alt metrics button that I click on, and then all of that comes up. Nice, so you don't have to do anything. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so um, this may not be widely used, and um, if they do it on like the journal web page, that would be ideal because that's a place where people would tend to look. If you put it on like your lab page or something, that would, you know, the only traffic you're going to get is if they happen to come to your lab page to, to see that. But, So that's out there. <clears throat> I think this is one, especially um, um, for early career folks, is that this is an opportunity that's often often overlooked um, as qualitative evidence of the impact of individual articles. And especially given the fact that sometimes when you submit, let's say for associate professor, some of the papers have been fairly recent. So you're not gonna see some of those other metrics. So what are some things that you can do to demonstrate that this is a good paper? Well, why not put the glowing reviews you got 
um, uh, from the from the uh, uh, the peer review process in that particular paper. Right? I mean, who hasn't gotten one that says this is the best article I've reviewed in my 30 years? <laughs> 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 yeah, so right. So you, you know. Um, you know, I, yeah. I made these up. I think it was like 11:30 at night. So, I, you know, but um, but but sometimes you get some comments like that that talk about the originality of your research or this is a really important step for the development of this. I would include those things. That, I think that's important to share because remember, the people who are reviewing your dossier are not necessarily in your profession. So, if you are are providing um reviewer comments who are presumably experts in that area and they're saying nice things about you, you should you should share that. You should write about that. Um, that's important because remember in the dossier, you're trying to convince people who may or may not understand your research, right? And the further the further up the chain it gets, the less they know uh, about your profession, you need to give as much evidence as you can to demonstrate um, quality. So um, don't be afraid to use that that uh, that sort of thing. If your article wins an award, um, obviously you want to you want to characterize that uh, as well. Um, and but when you do that, describe the award a little bit. So if you just say um, I won the the uh, Jones Award um, for this paper, I mean that doesn't help. But if you say you know this was uh, let's say that this was um, uh, this is the award for the best paper of the year for this particular journal or um, it's selected by the editorial board or something along those lines. Just characterize the meaning of that award so people will understand that. If you win the Nobel Prize, let me know. <laughs> so I want to talk about putting all this together a little bit because we talked about a lot of different metrics. And, and the goal on this is not, we're, we're not um, trying to study to become digital metric experts here. But, but we want to use these metrics to help develop your dossier so that you have the best possible chance um, as it relates to uh, promotion. Okay. So I've said this a number of times, use multiple measures of impact, right? And contextualize those for the reader. So this, a lot of what we're talking about needs to be in the narrative, right? When you just list this, and I'll tell you, I've seen, I've seen this, and I think this is a, a good faith effort but I don't think it gets to where it needs to be, is people will list their publications and they'll put the impact factor um, at the end of it, you know, the citation, okay? But as we've discussed, without any context, I'm not sure if that's good or not. I suppose if it's a 7.0, that's pretty good no matter what journal, but most of them aren't, right? Um, so, you know, just, just putting the metric isn't helpful. In the dossier, talk about that. Even Divide it into those three categories that we talked about in terms of you know, the impact. Talk about the journal, the quality of the journals, the impact of you as an, uh, an author, and even the individual articles. Right? I would suggest having a ridiculously long dossier, but get to the point so that all that's contextualized for the reader. Well, that was kind of my question. Is, is how much do they at reality read? I mean, how... how what can you expect them to actually notice, and, and what, when are they going to quit reading? Well, if you're talking about they, I'm one of those people, and I read those very carefully. Because that's the only way I can contextualize. Because I'm not in, you know, we have so much uh, diversity in here in terms of the areas. I can't know all that. So you have to, you have to tell me. I mean, you have to provide the evidence of all of that in, in the narrative. A great narrative goes a long way. Uh, in that regard, to clarify things and to, to put all that into context. Um, we're, we're having conversations with the chairs and the uh, um, review committees about this, and I'm going to talk about the review committees in just a second, um, that we, we really need to get focused in on you know, these type of things and demonstrate if you've met the criteria. And it has to be the criteria in the elaboration. We can't make stuff up. Right? So we need, to, we need to pay attention to what you're writing because you have to convince us that you met or exceeded uh, the expectations that are articulated in the elaboration. So I think that a lot of this quantitative data, I have a difficult time writing in a narrative format for that. 
would it be acceptable to create like a table oh, sure. and put all that information and then be able to do a reference C table one when you're absolutely that? that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, the the one table that I said you don't have to use this, you may want to use something like that. Yeah. You know, it, it would it would uh, <laughs> summarize those data very helpful. Then you could just focus on the explanation in yeah. the text. Yeah. That's actually good form in science. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I feel like you're trying to. Talk because I would never go through all those numbers when I'm like writing an article. Correct. I would put it in the table and then I would talk about the table. Mm -hmm. So yep. that's the scene. And you might have three different ones one that relates to journal yeah. quality, one whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, as um, you know, as a post hoc to this, I hope you all talk to each other about that. Like, how are you going to organize this? And you know, I don't think the idea is that this is supposed to be an essay contest. Just that you can write a great essay, but it is important that you articulate um, how you're, you're meeting or exceeding the operations. In this case, we're just talking about um, uh, professional activity, but the same holds true for the other areas, too. Right? <clears throat> so we talked about that. You know, great journals can have lousy articles, and great articles can be published in lower-ranked journals, and an article may be cited because it's flawed, or sometimes the metrics may not capture early career, all those type of things. So, don't rely on uh, one or two things. Triangulate. Have have a, a number of measures of impact and quality, and try to triangulate. So in your in your professional activity statement or your your uh, narrative, um, I think that specifically talking about the metrics is one of the pieces that's important. But um, and especially in um, the, the evaluations along the way, the second year evaluation and so forth, um, it's important to put some con context around what your, your research agenda is, right? So what problems are you trying to solve with your research? We're trying to see how that fits together, right? If the papers are off in random areas, it might be difficult for the reviewer to understand what, <clears throat> you know, what, the, what you're trying to accomplish with your research. Put it in a big picture. Um, talk about how you progress towards becoming an independent scholar. It's not unusual um, for an early career scholar to, to, uh, to play a junior faculty member role in, a, in an article. So in some of the areas, for example, um, the first author is uh, the junior person who's taking the lead on that piece of the study, and the last author is the senior author. Right? And so somehow showing that you're working towards becoming the senior author you know, is a, a valuable thing to talk about. So not everybody does that with the references. I'm not telling you you have to follow that. That You have to follow what's typical in your discipline, but I just gave that as an example. Provide evidence that your research is having an impact. And that's what we were talking about today, right? So that would be the, the piece in the, the dossier where you're talking specifically about the things here. And then um, talking about how your research shows promise for ongoing publications or funding, kind of giving a trajectory. Because um, in, in the context of a, a promotion or a, or, or a tenure type of position, the institution is making a decision um, uh, that would provide some, some job security. And part of that decision is, is this person going to continue to be a productive member of the faculty? And you can't have a whole career's worth of stuff. You have to use the information that's there. So you have to be able to provide some, some context on your trajectory to convince the folks that this is a good decision, right? So, you know, um, this is a, another really important point. This is an important point for candidates, and it's an important point for the review committees, chairs, and, and deans is that um, the, we need to understand what the professional activity requirements are in the relevant elaborations, right? And um, as a candidate, it's your job to clearly articulate how you have met or exceeded those criteria. Okay? So if in your, your school elaborations, for example, it says that you have to have five index peer-reviewed journal articles, clearly state that you have that, right? Um, so you don't want people to guess whether or not you met those specific criteria. So specifically uh, clarify that for people. And likewise, well, I'll talk about the, the review committees in a second. And if it's in a, if it's in a, a pre-tenure review, describe how you are on track to meet those criteria. 
So if the bar is right here and you're developing and you're right here, talk about that, where you are and how you view yourself getting to the, the, uh, uh, that, that area. Be very explicit about that. Um, and then, um, and then yeah. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to put these out of order. So when we talk about the review committees, the chairs, and the deans, we need to describe how the candidate does or does not meet or exceed the requirements described in the elaborations. We cannot designate expectations that are not described in the elaborations. We can't make stuff up that we're using to evaluate you, right? So um, it's helpful on both sides to be very clear how you're meeting, whether it's this section, you know, the, the professional activity or teaching or service, be very explicit on how you feel, demonstrate the evidence that you met or exceeded those criteria, be, be very clear. <coughs> I'm gonna ask the same of the review committees, the chairs, and, and, and I will include in, in my letters as well um, that specific information. So help them. Uh, help them see how you, you meet or exceed those criteria. So I, I pop this in there because this, this topic comes up every now and then. Um, <laughs> I, I think there was a discussion about it, gosh, not, <laughs> just right before we started the meeting, right? Um, so this idea of predatory journals, right? And or the also pay to publish journals. And so, you know, I don't have really solid advice for you on this. I, I can tell you some things that I think are important to consider. One is, if you look at the elaborations, and it talks about an indexed um, peer-reviewed journal, um, if there is a, a, a journal, regardless of, of the journal, that's not indexed, I think you need to think about that, because that is a requirement. Um, and you don't want to have all that work go into something that isn't going to help you in your tenure promotion. Um, there are concerns around the peer review process in these predatory journals. I'm going to tell you a story about um, uh, a previous institution that I was at. Um, and this is before, you know, uh, computers and stuff like that. Right? Um, so there was this um, group of folks in a certain part of the country that had started their own journal. And they did it out of a person's garage. And there was uh, people at five different institutions. And they developed this journal of film boy. And so um, they, they published this journal twice a year. They had a, an editorial board, which was those five people. Um, and the, the, all the articles came from those five people. And um, they submitted and they peer reviewed each other's stuff. They actually produced a journal. Um, and, um, and, they, and they distributed it to those five people. <coughs> and so, then the argument was, well, it's a peer review journal. Um, it's in my field. <laughs> so what are you, you know, what are you going to do about that, right? So um, you know that uh, just saying that something's peer reviewed could be something like that, right? Um, so uh, you know you get to think about those type of things, and and they also have journals where, um, and this has happened too, right? Uh, or if it hasn't. You see a journal say, oh, there's so-and-so on the editorial board. I know that person. And you call them up and say, hey, tell me more about this journal. And they say, I'm on that editorial board, right? They add people to that. I find those things. It's usually in a foreign country, and you have to send them a, de a cease and desist letter that knows you may not use my name, and I'm not on your editorial board, and you need to stop that right away. But you'll see things like that, too. And some of them are better than others to sniff out, but they're there. Um, there are high quality open access journals that collect fees from authors. So that's not the only criteria you can use to determine whether or not it's a predatory journal. But the predatory journal's sole aim is to collect money, not to publish quality work. And you know, it's interesting because you know, another criteria that people want to use is, well, you know, I got an editorial decision within two days on my paper. So, you know. That's pretty fast. <laughs> so, but I'm going to tell you something. If any of you submit an article to JAMA, it won't be two days. Yes, it will. Really? It, it might be less than that. If it's a no, if it's a no, it's it's 
could be within minutes, right? Um, and and sometimes then they'll, they'll say, we're interested in this topic, and now we're going to get some feedback. So you may get some, a, a, a professional decision on some of those very quickly. So, you know, you got to be, you know, that's not the only criteria, right? Because different journals behave that way. So there's, I included in here a couple of resources that you can go through. This uh, thing, check, submit, is helpful to sniff out predatory journals. Um, I think for the most part you could do that, but there are some tools that can help you. This is a, an article that talks about them and gives you some additional criteria you can use to evaluate that. I will say this, if you're focusing on the official journal of your professional organization and things of that nature, those are usually not predatory. And if they are, you need to be getting together with your colleagues. <laughs> um, also in there, um, Gerald is glad to help you out. He can help you with these metrics. They also have some other old metric things that they do through the library that he can do that. But um, he's glad to help you if you need some help doing a search or beginning to get these metrics uh, together. And then uh, these websites have information about all of those metrics, um, some more detailed information if you're interested in learning more about them. And it may be helpful for you. Um, you know, I gave some examples on how um, uh, you know, the, the cell citation can influence one. So there may be some metrics over others that, that would best reflect what you're trying to do in your profession and so on and so forth. Do we, so I talked to Jerry before about getting access to Comdisk Dome. Do we have access to Comdisk Dome, which is a library, same like PsycInfo or any of the other ones that you can search for. And we currently don't have that. So for our students who are wanting to read some of our um, professional organizations articles, a lot of times you can't find that through UT. So they have to come to us and we have to go through our professional organization account to download the articles, to then and give those to the students. Mm -hmm. So is there any way do we have extra funds to be able to, to purchase access to another library through the UT Well, we system? That would have to be through our library. Yeah. Um, if they don't do it, yeah, they're, I mean, and this is a problem with libraries everywhere, right? Funding is going down and, and costs are going up for access to these type of things. I don't know that there's an immediate solution for that. But. Um, so clearly as you're talking about this, when you, when a dossier reaches you, you're expecting it's not just going to say, I published five articles in index journals, thank you very much. You want to see much more than that. And knowing that there's not very many of us sitting in this room, is there going to be mandated training in the college so when dossiers come into the school that we as reviewers would say, you need to add more to this, it's not enough, so that when it reaches you, you know, you're not reading nothing. Um, and my other question is whether this is, I know, You've tended to be pretty proactive, whether this is you saying this is coming, so we're just going to get ready for it, or is this all the deans going around kind of sharing this, I mean, coming from UCAP provost level and so forth, that they want much more detail about the quality and impact of your work versus just, here's what I did. And they're, um, they're actually working on university-wide uh, tenure promotion guidelines that they're not going to say what like what the ex specific expectations are, but they're going to lay out general expectations. Like, you know, if it's if it's publications, it should be indexed. It should be there. You should provide evidence of quality. You know, those type of things. Um, I think actually our elaborations are, are pretty good. I mean, it, I think it covers most of the those type of things. But there is going to be uh, a push. We we had the advantage, I think in that we reorganized into a new, a new school, so we had to look at all that anyway. So we just had the opportunity to, to mine everyone's collective thoughts on that, to try to build, you know, the, to build the, an elaboration that we can. One of the things I want to point out, though, is that um, the, the criteria under which you're evaluated are the elaborations that are relevant to you. So if you came in, so when you, submit your dossier, you include the, the elaborations that you came in, those are the standards that you're dealing with. So I, the, the talk that I just did was um, the uh, elaboration language is the, the new ones. So um, you need to 
you need to know where you're at and which ones apply to you. But the idea still holds true, right? You need to. Right. Yeah. If I can add to that, Dean, um, part of the strategic plan for the university as well deals exactly with what we discussed this morning in that when we're providing the provost, the president, with our lists of publications, etc., they're looking at the quality as well, and that's part of the new strategic plan. So the annual reports, which you've not seen yet, has that kind of information in. So this semester we will be asking for that on any publication that recently. So yeah, we were a little bit ahead of the curve, um, but the university wide now is going to be requiring this. And regardless of that, we have a set of elaborations, and I want our faculty to have the opportunity to put their best foot forward. And so I think it's important to have this conversation so everybody understands what the expectations are so that you can develop a dossier that best supports your application going forward. I like the, I like the success model better than the failure. Can you go back to the one slide so I can write down those words? Or those references on the other slide because we don't have them. Or, yeah, that one. Exactly. You don't have those? Isn't that in the handout? They're puny. Oh, they're too small. But yeah. <clears throat> this um, uh, we're going to put this video on the web page, and um, I'm also going to have the PDF of that uh, that you can download too. So, okay. Yeah, yeah that was just, good. Yeah, because yeah. these are hard to read. So you, can, you, can, you can do what I do in a regular document. I need big So any other, these are, um, was this helpful? Does it give some context on um, what this is about? And, and I hope if, as much as anything, it alleviated some, some anxiety that there's some specific H index expectation or journal impact factor type of thing. It's, it's just, a, it's one brick in the wall. Um, but building your story is a really key thing. Yeah. So uh, I'm really, really grateful for getting all this information put together in one place. And I love the distinction between the journal and the author because it just clarifies so many things for me that I can make it better. But the problem I'm having right now is that I submitted my docs here for this year. But I can just visually see how I can improve my own writing for next year and make it better. And also we go the electronic format so it would be easier to review it. So I just want you to recognize that. that um, I wish I had heard this like three weeks ago when I was <laughs> Yeah, And I, I understand that. That's, that's understandable. And, the, and some of you that have submitted um, uh, materials in the past, May remember getting some comments from me about ask, a, adding some things, and so I, you know, and, and as this came up, it became clear that that maybe it wasn't as clear as it could be. So that's what we're doing this session. So this is a, a progressive thing. I hope we continue to, to build and, and probably might be better to do this in the spring as well. I might send out a survey to see yeah. how late in the spring because again, the due dates are you should be working on this stuff yeah. before the school gets back. So, you know, but can I just ask a question as well, as someone who's going to be submitting their dossier next year for uh, consideration for the um, Let's say I have a bunch of publications and the, I give you all this information and I happen to be in the, the bottom ends of, of the quartiles or whatever. Is that, how is that, how do you, how are those kind of things going to be viewed? Is it, um, again, what I'm trying to say is that we're trying to use this as a way to just to educate people and try to get them to think about publishing in higher quality without any kind of being penalized for still publishing papers. It's just kind of a culture change here. Itself. Yeah, so so the idea is that you demonstrate the impact of your research. So I think I showed that I had uh, 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 journal articles that were low, but some of them were cited a lot. So, you know, there are lots of, I think the key is not to use any one metric. So if you have a journal that's in the third quartile or fourth quartile, um, but People are citing that, and it's you know it's advancing the knowledge. That's the picture that we need to paint relative to that. You know, another one is. I'm going to see if I can find that. So again, you're not going to be penalized for necessarily for publishing low impact, low quality papers. Mm -hmm. you're, not you're not going to say, okay, well you you've, you've, you've reached the number, but again, the quality is too low for it to really be considered as. Well, it does say, and, and um, I'm just 
Yeah, the, the, the elaborations that you have will describe how that is characterized. In the current ones, it says you have to provide evidence that your work is of quality and of impact, right? And so, um, what, what I was trying to talk about today is there's more, more than one way to skin that cat, and you have to put it into context. So, I want to go to, um, As, uh, this one, you can't see this, but so this is this is a listing of journals um, in the rehab category, and if you look at the top ten journals, almost all of them are neuro. And so, if um, for example you did more in orthopedics, then um, when you identify the quartile and where that that is in that particular category. Um, I think it would be very fair to say, look, I don't publish in the neuro stuff. That's not my area of expertise. So of the journals that related to ortho rehab, this one was the, the highest ranked one in that subset. That's perfectly fine. That's putting it in the, that's, I think that's a more responsible way to characterize that because some of those category errors are very broad. Um, and, you know, um, neuro rehab, for example, there are a lot more people working in that area. So the journal impact factors are higher. Um, you know, the amount of work is higher. So um, that's a, a fair and reasonable way. That's, that is um, using the data appropriately to contextualize your work. So if you have, for example, um, if you're in that very example, if, the, if you're an orthopedic and, um, I don't know if there's a, yeah, so Journal of Orthopedic and Sport Physical Therapy is there. That's the highest ranked orthopedic one. And in this case, it's not in the top it's in the top five. It's still pretty good, but what if it was lower? I would say that's the highest rated uh, orthopedic uh, rehab journal. Um, that should count for something, right? Yeah. What about real world impact? Because what we've talked about so far is how academics want to cite each other, but that doesn't translate into anything improving the world necessarily, although ideally it would get there. Some of us who are in applied fields it's all about what impact are we having in the world, and, and all of this may or may not have much to do with that. So, um, how would you how would you demonstrate that? Uh, if you do some work with people, like if you're Celia Williamson or somebody coming up under her, and you save one person from being trafficked, that's a big impact on the world. But that will not get you an impact. Factor. Well, but you know that, right? Well, why don't you talk about that? Well, no, but I'm, I'm not saying I would refuse to talk about it. What I'm saying is this is one way of saying impact, uh, and I'm wondering if other kinds of impact on the world will be considered as important as other people citing you. Or is it less important, but you still need it? Or, because... So in the... Let me answer it this way, because everything's, everyone is different. So in the context of your dossier, and you're describing the problem you're trying to solve, right? if you provide evidence of quality that relates to the problem that you're trying to solve with your professional activity, then that would be coherence in my mind. right? Um, if uh, it's, Everybody has a different reason for that, and they go. Now, I think it might be difficult to say that I was talking to somebody, and I know you're not saying this, but you know, if I was on the corner and someone, I was talking to someone about my research and they thought it was really cool, that's probably not a very strong piece of, of evidence, right? Right. But you know, a, a different way might even be, and especially in like the clinical or applied field, if you had some way to know that maybe a, 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 a technique that you're representing is now used in, um, you know, five different major health systems in the in the state. Um, or and, and we'll use a, a, a something that Celia did as an example to extend that. So there was a um, a training sheet that went to uh, nurses uh, about identifying uh, potentially trafficked individuals, mm -hmm. um, and it's been adopted by ProMedica. It's been adopted. So that's a measurable type of thing that you can do too, because that was research based. That wasn't just you know made up stuff. Yeah. I think alt metrics is also. You can look at the number of Facebook shares or the number of tweets. I know that it seems so strange for me to say, yeah, it was tweeted eight times. But when you're talking about those end users who are out in the field, and that's who you're really trying to influence to change their clinical practice, then that's why I'm having to become more willing to say, 
it was tweeted eight times, <laughs> even though it still feels really strange for me to have to talk about that in a professional writing type of way. But I think it's that the new, a new way to document mm -hmm. that people out in the fields are being exposed to this. But there is, and I think you've identified an important point. There's, you know, some of that is immeasurable, and you know, the the challenge is is the the nature of a dossier is you're pro providing evidence that you're doing what you said you were. So there's there's inherently going to be some limitation unless there's a way to measure it or capture that that information. But. Moving forward, after sitting at grad council this week and talking about this as well, moving forward, is the university going more towards quality over quantity then? Or are they looking for like a few quality and a bunch of quantity? Um, what is moving forward sort of what they're looking for? I think it's both. Okay. And so you have to differentiate um, the university's goal with your goal, right? Because um, when we talk about the university's goal of increasing the quantity and quality of research, that's moving means. It's not an individual thing, right? So um, as it relates to what we're talking about here, you need to meet the criteria that are defined in your, your uh, elaborations, right? Um, now, uh, that's that piece of it, right? But we also, I mean, doing research just for the sake of meeting the expectations on the dossier is kind of missing the point of why you would do scholarly work, right? You do scholarly work because you want to advance your profession, and that's why we're in this, right? So the hope is, is that this isn't just an exercise to meet the minimum expectations that are there, but you're contributing to your field, and, you're, and, and in the end, most of us, we we're helping people, right, with the kind of stuff that we do. The hope is that that, that would be something that would continue, right? And, and as we, we try to drive the quality up and we find um, additional resources to invest, internal, external, or whatever, to invest in research that we can do higher quality, bigger breadth, more impactful type of things as we go along. And for us, impacting the community is a huge uh, uh, important thing to do. So, you know, if you want to do a large scale community based project, it costs money, right? So, you know, building a dossier and being able to compete for those dollars to be able to do those projects that answer really hard questions, I think that's the overall goal. And it's a mean thing. So some people may do more of this and some people may do more of that. Um, but you need to think about your individual uh, scholarship goals, right? What, what in the world are you trying to change and how can you, how can you do it? Well, I'm scared. <laughs> Why? Uh, most of my publications are already out there. And I really have no idea what I know. Like I just had one in the top journal of my field, but I have no idea what most of the other journals' rankings are. I really didn't know 90% of this information. So I was just about to submit something to a journal that could purchase for some of this. I'm going to go look it up and see if, I, if it's a predator. I mean, I don't know. So this is all new to me. Unfortunately, it's kind of post hoc. So, I mean, you know, what are, what are the what are the elaborations that you're under? That's the, that's those, the important but, question. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it, it is a little scary, it's scary moving forward. Yeah. Thinking about this, I think in general, um, Barry, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that the the new elaborations um, are a little more stringent than some of the other ones, the ones that are from the various units. That have been and I know the other thing to keep in mind too is that. The um, school elaborations can be different. Um, so in uh, uh, population health, I think the quantity expectations around publications is higher than the than the college levels. And I'm not sure in social justice whether it refers to indexed journals or not. Um, but because the college one does, and that sets the minimum, it's applied in the schools. But I think. For many of us that have been here a few years now, this does represent a pretty big change in the way that we're reporting our information. That's, so that's why I'm, you know, I know there will be folks that don't look at that and kind of concerned about, you know, about the quality and how it works. But you say that it's just such a, it's a change from where we work. 
few years ago. Yeah. And I think it's important to have conversations, right? And, and um, I, I wanna, I'm going to say this one more time, right? Is that the you're going to be evaluated by the elaborations that you came under, right? So I would read those, and hopefully you've been reading those anyway, because that's what you know. That's how you need to arrange your your dossier. But um, you're not going to be held. You can't be held to a standard that's not articulated in in the elaboration. Yeah. So I've been being given advice uh, from all sorts of people that they that. They think the newer elaborations are much, much more clear and easy for people to see if you've met. And I've been told I should switch to the newer ones. I've been told by a number of folks um, that it's our choice to switch. And you should, because it'll be easier for people to be able to see, yes, you've done your five or whatever. And, and um, I have not heard that from somebody at your level, so I thought I would ask, because in taking that advice I did on my lap, the submission I just did, I switched over to explaining in terms of the new stuff. So is that a good idea, or is that something that the other folks not at your level were wrong about? I don't think there's right or wrong there. I, I, if, if you have the choice, I would pick the ones that improve your chances the best, right? Or the, makes sense. Yeah, past practices, yes, you can. You can go to a newer one, but you can't go back yeah. to an old one. So you can only you can only come forward. You can't go back. Does that make sense? So yes, you're okay. Is it, in other words, at least in terms of past practices, that's been you know, accepted. Approach. So I, I would just say that uh, it seems like it would be very necessary to put those elaborations at the very beginning of your dossier, so that who's ever up the line. You know, if we've got this new provost, I'm just saying, I don't know, you know, a new provost that comes in that has an eye to that this is what is an expectation, and, and anybody else, they kind of forget perhaps what year you came in. So I think it would behoove people to be very clear. I don't know. It's not even a paper dossier anymore, is it? No, but the, the elaborations that you're being evaluated against have to be included in your electronic yeah, okay. I said the budget yeah. actually yeah. didn't have elaborations. Okay. But, so, but don't depend on that. In your in your narrative, specifically say what those right. those things say and how you you meet it. Make it easy for people to you know. But I'm just thinking subliminally. Are they thinking, oh, this isn't a high factor, impact factor, even though it wasn't required at that time. You know, are they going to are they going to honor? I guess it's maybe well, a lot of this. Are gonna honor. You know, people are people, and you know, <laughs> I can't begin to predict all the weird things that can happen, but I don't know I don't know how that would be defensible if they held you to a standard other than the one that's articulated in the elaborations that you fall under. So I know within the context of the school, um, let's say for example, and I can't control what happens after that, if I got a dossier or I came forward from the College Promotion Committee, and to, in my opinion, they were um, holding you to a standard other than the one that's articulated in that, I would put that in my letter and say, I disagree uh, with that. This is the elaboration. This is what they did. And it's my opinion that, that they met it. So sometimes they go forward with different you know, votes as you go through, go through the system. But it's a double-sided knife, too. If, you know, if they, were, if they were, were not paying attention to those and I felt like they didn't meet that, I, I would feel it would be my responsibility to say that. So. Would you say just in terms of some of the shift, if we're um, minimally meeting uh, elaborations that were put forth prior to these ones, um, but knowing that the university is moving in a direct, different direction to, in the narrative, articulate why you went in the direction that you did and then also note why you're changing that um, direction in, in order to align the trajectory that the university is now moving on, that would be a way to kind of explain that. Shift oh, like in what your your goals are? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The no, more you can contextualize you your, yeah. Under, you know, explain that shift, or if you started on a different path and, and now can and show uh, that you've taken. And as you, you know, as you develop your materials and, and you have questions like that, you know, um, share with a mentor or amongst each other. Say, do you think I that this was clear, so that, you know, predict questions that people might have and, and directly address them so that they don't have to guess. 
because we're all smart people, we can make up all kinds of reasons for stuff that we see. So the more clarity and direction you can provide in that narrative, the better. This, I don't, when I came in, you know, as peers, we looked at each other, you know, I looked at dossier, you know, or I had mentors or whatever, and things have changed. You know, it used to be paper, and I came from the campus, and they had, the chair would look at it or whatever. So is there a group of people who looked at it, now it's electronic, like, or is there someone that could look at it and say, okay, it's ready to go forward? I mean, you know, because I haven't done it yet on the money, or you haven't done it that way. Well, the candidate has the control on when they put the Right, materials. but I can have, is there someone like experts? <laughs> like a pre-review or something? Yeah. That's like, already accounted for in the faculty handbook, the pre-evaluation pre of it ready correctly. Okay. So no, that you can look for feedback that's not binding. Okay. So, I just haven't done it electronic. So that's, you know, it's just different. So. Yeah. yeah, so if they may not, um, if it's a like a technical question, mm -hmm. if they're not part of the the workflow, they're not going to be able to look at your dossier on Faculty 180. But but you have to have that in electronic form. So if you have your you know your your narrative done and you wanted them to give some feedback on it, you'd have to provide them with a okay. copy of that. Yeah. So but that's again this is one of those differences between CPA and non CPA people. You have more of a flexibility than when you go up, and so right. you have that pre evaluation process already. Uh, laid out in the faculty handbook who looks at it and the feedback yes. and all those sorts of things. Go up, yeah. My understanding that's in there. The C CBA folks don't have that luxury okay. for that. that okay. Okay. I just, yeah. It has to be submitted as required. Yeah. But, and, and CBA, collective bargaining agreement. So I just had a curiosity does that word faculty handbook apply to people that are not uh, AAUD then? Because I was going to say, I hadn't heard we had one. And if so, where no, do I get it? You're not, you're not, you know, the faculty handbook is actually the term that's for, uh, for the non-CPA non, non faculty. Excellent. All right, then I didn't miss something important. See, that's so no, just what I wanted to check. Thank it. you. It's two different, two different uh, jargons. Thank the, you. The, Thank we, you. We, have, we have a lot of diversity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the piece I struggle with is, uh, you know, if you refer back to prior to the merger and the indexing, so that the old faculty handbook. And, and you know, one term is, uh, when you're going up for promotion, say from associate to full, it's excellence. Excellence in teaching, excellence in research. What, you know, what does that mean, excellence? I can't help but think that in order to better define excellence, you know, we have to, describe it by some of the variables that you've shared today, although these variables aren't, you know, technically being held accountable for the, you know, for the, the folks that are submitting that, right? They're going on based on their, you know, the former handbook. So how, how do we work with that? Um, yeah, that so as much as you um, try to make the elaborations in the general sense, right, as clear as you can for everybody. There's going to be some judgment that's involved with that. Um, I don't think you can completely remove that from the process. The the opportunity that you have, I think, in that is to to contextualize the the framework of what excellence is. And in, in the new elaborations, there's that opportunity. But regardless of what it is. You have the opportunity in your dossier to talk about what the profession's uh, s standard is around, you know, uh, expectations, the, the kind of impact you have, the, the audience that you serve, and all those types of things you can put that into context. You know, the the, the challenge is if you take if you take any one indicator, right? I mean, even if you do them collectively, like where does it go from being pretty good right. to excellent to whatever? And um, out of fairness, I I haven't seen that like um, uh, hair splitting. You know, I, no, I would judge this as um, sub excellent but very good. You know, I. <laughs> but it's a fair question, Cindy, because. I mean, if that language is used, it, it would it would be imprudent to ignore that, right. you know. Mm -hmm. But say it kind of goes back to some folks that have been here a while that 
you know, for many of us, excellence mm -hmm. was simply getting a publication of, right. you know, that was considered excellence. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to define it anything more than exactly. you got it out. Hooray. Obviously, that minimal, that's not evidence that we're is, uh, in, any longer acceptable. Yeah, this has been really helpful. Yes, I just want to say, I didn't know 90% of the stuff. So, this is good. And, you know, these, um, I'm glad to have these conversations. I mean, I, I, I don't want there to be um, mystery involved in this process. I want you to spend your time doing the stuff, right, and not uh, worrying about that. And I do know, just based on conversations, um, people had, uh, they, they kept one, you know, things would get started as, well, we need to include um, uh, measures of impact or quality, right? So that, then you would say, like a journal impact, and then the thing would be, well, the dean says we have to include journal impact factors. And then the, then the, you know, the, the conversation would get derailed from what's really important, right? And that's having the, you know, putting together the story of evidence that you're, you're doing well. That is a piece. Um, I, you know, I think it would be valuable to include that information, but not just that information. It has to be put into context. That's the good dossier, right? That puts it into context. We know what you want, what your problems you're trying to solve. We know what direction you're going. We know why you're making the decisions that you did in terms of the venues that you're selecting for publication. And then you're having uh, an impact uh, in the end. And I think if, you know, the, I can predict a, a question, it would be like, well, um, what if I put forth my dossier and, um, you know, I have, uh, I've met the minimum number of, uh, journals in terms of quantitatively. None of my papers have ever been cited. Um, none of my papers have been uh, identified and has, has been downloaded from the, uh, the website. You just, there's, everything is zero. You know, I can't tell you that, that that wouldn't create a challenge in the system that you haven't been able to demonstrate some level of impact. And that's why it's important to have multiple measures, right, to, to do that, and especially in early career, um, not all those metrics are going to be um, super high, and that's understandable. You know, talk about it in the context of where you are in time and uh, developing your, your research and so forth. I have another question about dossiers, et cetera, that isn't about this, about the scholarship part of it, but it's more about teaching. You can ask that. Oh. So are we going to do another one like this for Teaching if we yeah but if we think it's beneficial beneficial one then on teaching we're going to focus on the no I just the, the the general comment I had is that what, I mean a lot of us are in professional programs that we only like I only teach my core this the courses I teach once a year so for me to demonstrate increasing proficiency or you know, excellence in teaching it will have to be like let's say five years before I have the opportunity to fine-tuning, etc. along the way. Versus somebody who's teaching two sections of, I don't know, say, and physiology, one or something, every semester. So they have a lot more time. You know, they, just, the data is a little bit different. How would that help? Right, I would, I would use the same argument. So if that's the frequency of when you teach right. that course, then, you know, you just need to demonstrate that you're that's using right. information as appropriate to do that. So. Yes. Let's say you did a, a survey of the students at the end of the year, yeah. and they had some suggestions on how to improve it. And you you did those, you implemented those. And that, you know that's a, an example too. Okay. And we won't get into the whole teaching thing, but um, and then actually this this discussion is coming up as they're drafting some overall university ones. You know, a lot of the teaching ones tend to be list the classes that you're in, put the syllabus in there, right? right? How many advisees do you have? Right. And it's like there's no evidence that anybody learned anything. Right. <laughs> I just we, I, we're concerned about we want to make sure that it works. <laughs> if you did a teaching session, I think I would come to it to that as well and think that would be useful. Just as an FYI if you want to plan something like that. Thank you. Thank you. If you have individual I'll stay as long as you want. Google Scope, you can get to their webpage. It is a little bit funky to find your way around in there, but okay, go, 